Okay. We should be live in a moment. There was Comcast issues yesterday? Yeah. We have Comcast here. And that's, was, was that causing you guys problems yesterday? Uh, yesterday I was working on email all day and our coders were just worried about Git, so it wasn't really an issue. Um, cause that's the kind of thing that whatever. <laughs> Apparently we're live. <laughs> Hello everyone. So today we're at Pamela's Cosmo, the CosmoQuest office, Pamela's there and clearly, yes. Uh, there are some infrastructure issues that need to be resolved for the CosmoQuest office. But she does have a spiffy uh, green screen behind her. Check yes. It, check it out. Check it out. Um, it's true. Yeah. So that is that is not actually a pool of galaxies floating in the background. That is uh, just a big piece of fabric that's colored green. How are you doing this? Uh, so in Zoom, there's actually a chroma key in Zoom directly. So you pick what color you want, you upload an image, and Zoom does it for you. Wow. So I just set up Zoom once, and now it's my joy whenever I want it to be. That's funny. OK. And I just fling it somewhere else in the room if I don't want to have that as my background. It does definitely appear to be making you sort of go pink. Um, and then go back. Maybe it's your camera, whatever. It's the camera. Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's fine. We'll just, you know, we'll get by. And then the other problem that we're having is that your microphone, you don't have your fancy microphone. You've got, well, you do, but you don't have a cord for your fancy microphone. Yeah, exactly. So it turns out that the Yeti microphone uses... It uses the smaller... But not the smallest. Not the smallest, no. So no. I have bigger. Mm -hmm. I have smaller. Mm -hmm. I do not have correct. Yes, the middle, the middle size. So yeah. there will be bringing one in from home right. occurring. But, you know... This is uh, better than better than uh, better than nothing. So, uh, if those of you wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, we're going to be doing a live episode of Astronomy Cast. I'm going to say hi to a couple of people, although you may have to say hello again. Anyway, hi to Ben Kalo, Ben Lowe, Brian Stab, Brooke Mulligetta, Charles White, Christopher Beck, Doug Joseph, Graham Walbridge, Guido Bieber, Helg Bjarkog, John Seffel, Johnny Zed, Jordan Couch, Quad Libet, Matthias Rau. Nancy Graziano, Rachel Fry, Rankle Prozo, Rick Schwartz, Ricky Buxton, Robert Scott Herrick, Steve Heistand, Susie Murph, Tech Tang, and Yamaguchi-san. Right on. Hey, everybody. So I'm back from Patricon. How was it? Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, it was amazing. That's I got, so cool. Uh, I got a chance to meet uh, a couple of people who are my heroes. Um, so that was, uh, that was pretty exciting. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it was just great to spend a couple of days just talking with other creators and, uh, Hank Green, you know, from the vlog brothers did a great presentation and the gist was, yes, this work is really hard, but you can't complain because it's like the best job in the world. Right. And this is kind of what you've been saying for years. Yeah. 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 So it's like, like. Uh, like, you'll never hear me complain about my job because I have the best job. I, I know. But it is hard. It's really hard And the work. second anyone complains about their job in front of you, you proselytize. What you <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I'm sorry. Do you get to, like, hang out every day and talk about science? Yeah. So, no, it's true. Anyway, uh, so, but it is hard work. So, um, you know, you have this sort of two questions. But it was great to just hang out and, like, talk about the issues that we have and come up with solutions. And it's great just to hear other creators who are on the Patreon platform and the solutions they've come up with. It Like, the, the, the different kinds of creative projects that they're working on, cartoonists and people that are doing... Uh, science fiction audio books and uh, a bunch of like pinup and cosplayers and musicians. It was great. That's awesome. Yeah. 
All right, so we're going to do an uh, episode of Astronomy Cast, and then uh, we'll stick around and answer your questions about space and astronomy. And my camera it can't decide colors. No, no, no. This was, uh, this is not meant to be. <laughs> Hold on, let's try doing this. That, I think, just... Do, oh, don't, God. Don't worry about it. Just don't stop thinking about it. This is, <laughs> we can't fix this now. <laughs> So, well, that was bad. Yeah, we can't. This can't be fixed right now. So just, just don't worry about it. Just okay. stop. Just stop, Ripley. You're just you're grinding metal. All right. I'm ready to press record. If you're ready to press record, I'm going to ditch the green screen that is like here. Roll away green screen. All right. My, my universe has a hole in it. My computer is having a meltdown. I'm just going to give up on everything right now. That's good. Just look into the camera and science. I can. That's all we I'll, need from you. I'll try. That's okay. all we need. You don't have to do anything else. Okay. Let's, uh, I've let's... banished you over here. You're on a different screen now. Okay, great. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Pressing record. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Press record. Okay, I am recording. I'm recording in stereo. Hold on, sorry. Different computer than normal. Ah, sigh. Okay, ready to press record again? I'm, I'm ready. The people, okay, who, I'm, the people who showed up here, they know what they're getting. They know they're getting the, the full astronomy the cast raw, experience. Raw, unadulterated yeah. Yeah, exactly. making of sausage. All right, here we go. Okay, I'm pressing record. It's recording. It's recording in mono. Right on. Hello, Chad. Yes, this is a different microphone, Chad. You yes. are going to not enjoy it quite so much. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't have her proper microphone. Astronomy Cast, episode 465, Exploiting Interfering Light. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. We need to apologize in advance for your audio quality. Your proper yes. microphone isn't with you, and you are recording with a headset microphone, and but you're practicing the best mic, the, your professional mic control training to make the best possible sound that you can so kudos you know sometimes the cable isn't with you literally and figuratively and you just make do it's true you're suffering from both today <laughs> <laughs> the force though is with you uh any announcements to make this week i i i don't think so uh we are getting into the holiday season so we will probably be recording uh, strange days and hours off and on. Uh, we are going to do our best to record on time next Friday for those of you who like to watch the live episodes. Uh, but I will be at a meeting in Washington, D.C., so it will be oh. hotel internet. Uh-oh. Maybe if someone in Washington, D.C. has a, like a super fancy internet connection, uh, let us know. <laughs> yes. Um, but... I have an announcement to make. You do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's uh, your announcement? We're writing a book. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not writing the book. I am helping the book get written. So, uh, but Dave, this is like super early announcement. As we get closer to it, I'll, I'll give more info. But the gist is uh, Dave Dickinson, who's the visual astronomer on our team at Universe Today, is going to be writing a book. And it's going to be like a comprehensive guide to amateur astronomy. It's the Universe Today's guide to the skies i forget the exact title that we're using right now but it's going to have like just how to like how to choose a telescope and how to what things to see but we're going to try and make it a more modern book for the modern age so the things like accessing online telescopes and the online communities that are out there and ways that you can do citizen science with your telescope and stuff and then the other cool part is we've got a great community of amateur photographers out on instagram so we're going to be 
showcasing a lot of that photography. So I hope it's going to be a, like a astronomy book that, that nobody's ever seen before. And it's going to be coming out in about a year from now. So that's awesome. Yeah. But, uh, but Dave is working hard on it right now. And, uh, as we get closer to what it's actually going to lo look like, uh, we'll get your help and, uh, get people's help, uh, beta testing it and stuff. So that's just a really early initial uh, announcement. Let's move on to the show. Here we go. Electromagnetic radiation, also known as light, is pretty handy for astronomers. They can use it to directly and indirectly observe stars, nebulae, planets, and more. But as you probably know, light can act like a wave, creating interference patterns that teach us even more about the universe. All right, Pamela. Interference. Yes. Go. So I uh, basically waves uh, can interfere with one another. And if you've ever been to the ocean, you've probably seen this. You have two waves that go between piers, go between boats and come out the other side, maybe at a slightly different angle. And when the high points of the wave combine, you get a bigger wave. When the high point and the low point of the waves combine, you get flat still water. And what we're used to experiencing with water also happens with light. And in this case, when you get the waves synced up so that the highs and lows are all aligned, you get beautiful, bright, coherent light. When the highs and lows are exactly out of sync, you get darkness, lack of light. And in between, you get all manner of different intensities. And the way the intensity varies tells us exactly how much the light is and isn't out of sync and allows us to measure things, which is a cool and awesome thing to get to do. All right. So let's let's provide people with some examples. What is what is kind of like the the main use? I mean, I know that that, you know, when you and we've talked about this in the past about like the double slit experiment and things like that, that you can make light essentially interfere with itself. And by doing so, you get sort of peaks and valleys, like, as you said, like like waves of, of water. Pretend that that light doesn't act like a particle right now. Um, but sort of what is the classic use of this phenomenon of of light? So there's the classic use in terms of the way we abuse it in science, which is doing single slit and double slit experiments to see how light does and doesn't interfere. But then there's all the practical uses, which is why I wanted to do this episode on exploiting light interfering. And this is where we start to get into things like CD players, Blu-ray players, DVD players. All of these devices have inside of them lasers that are bouncing off the engraved surfaces of our media. And the reason that each progressive kind of player has been able to store more and more data is because we've been able to do more and more uh, high resolution measurement of lasers of increasingly short colors that allow us to pack the data more closely together to get more information onto a surface. So when you're dropping that CD into your CD player, all that's really happening is instead of a needle like a record player going around and going up and down as it goes up and down in the grooves of the record, what's happening is laser light is going across the surface of the CD and how it bounces back is or isn't interfering in a way that tells us uh, whether or not it's hitting a pit or a peak on the surface of the CD. So you've got, we've all got, as long as we have a CD player or, or a DVD drive in our computer, we've got a device that depends on interfering light to function. Exactly. And, and so we now rely on interfering light for our storage media. And that's just something that's kind of cool to think about 
where this basic physics that when we learn it in school, we're like, how am I ever going to use the fact that CDs interfere, not CDs, that laser light interferes? Well, it's how you play your games on your Xbox. Right. Well, now people care. Now they're listening. Uh, now they're now you got their attention. You just have to put things in the right language, right? Um, but so I mean that's a great way to sort of explain how we use this in a practical sense. But but how do astronomers use it? So so for astronomy, I and part of the inspiration for doing this episode is we see interfering light in things like LIGO, where we're making very very precise measurements of the distance between two objects. So the detections with LIGO were made because a variety of different beams spread out across the planet detected changes in the length of the beam with offsets in time that corresponded for how long it would take something traveling at the speed of light to get between these various places. So as the gravitational wave swept across the world, it changed the laser path distance by just enough to change what was being detected from the laser going up and down the laser path. Right. And so uh, like, let's just sort of understand this, right? You've got this, this laser emitter, you've got this um, uh, bounce, you know, a mirror at the other end of this, of this big, long uh, detector machine. And then the laser pulse is, is sent down and it bounces back and forth between the emitter and the, this mirror at the end of this big, long hallway. And then it bounces back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and makes, so, that it's, so that it's essentially traveled a very long distance when and then it gets captured again. And it is interfere is essentially they can see the interference pattern of what this laser is doing and it's a way to sort of make sure that the laser is perfectly aligned and so that if that gravitational wave passes over and stretches the length of the pathway then it gets out of alignment and they can measure precisely how out of alignment that is giving you that measurement of the of the gravitational wave which is which is just amazing. And I guess they're going to be taking that and scaling it up when the future, like the LISA and some of these other gravitational wave systems work, but then they're going to be traveling potentially millions of kilometers and still being able to tell, you know, the interference. And, and the key to making this work is they have two different paths that the light can take. And so you start with a single laser, you send the light down two different paths bring it together and you tune the device so that it interferes in a known way, preferably creating a bright point of light. And then you look for changes in that brightness that indicates that the uh, light is no longer interfering the way you would like it to. And I, why is interference the technique that they use for this level of precision? What, what, what is special about interference that is different from some other way of measuring the light? It's, it's because we can start to use the light to be able to measure things at distances down to the nanometer, which is a meter zero, 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 one of a meter. Right. And, and so that nanometer size differences, variations that we're able to get. So if you're doing interference with a red laser, you're looking at being able to measure changes of a wavelength, which in this case is 635 nanometers. If you're able to precisely use a blue laser where blue has an even shorter wavelength, you can start to measure things down to just 445 nanometers, which is part of the blue in blue ray. And by having this wavelength of light level precision, we may not know exactly how many wavelengths there are between two things, but once it's set up and once it's tuned, we know that there's exactly a integer number of these wavelengths. And if something goes from being the bright pattern of positively interfering to the 
blackness of destructive interference where the peak and the trough line up perfectly. We know that we had a shift of half a wavelength. So 222.5 nanometers if you're using that blue laser. And the only way we can precisely measure that kind of a variation in real time is with lasers and interference. Right. Uh, so I'm just kind of imagining, you know, if you were looking, if you're a scientist, say, working at LIGO, and you're looking at that interference pattern or detecting it, like, are you, how big is the interference pattern? Like, how, how well can it be seen? Can you see it with your eyes or do you need, you know, or is that interference pattern as small as the wavelengths of the light? So, so the interference pattern itself, uh, I, I have to admit, I haven't gone and stood in LIGO or looked at pictures in LIGO of, of exactly uh, how it looks on their detector. But from the uh, interferometers, interference, the systems that I've set up, and any of you who have a CD and a laser pointer can do this for yourselves. Uh, what you do is you bounce the laser off the grid on the CD, uh, still have an AOL CD kicking around. They're perfect for this. And <laughs> they have no I, other purpose. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, the the grooves in the CD are essentially a grating, and when the laser light bounces off of this, it will create a pattern on the wall with a bright central point and then a series of additional points that are all of the places where you have positive interference and the spacing between these points on the wall and the distance from the wall to your CD allows you to backwards calculate what is the size of the pits on your CD, which if you're feeling really industrious means you can actually use a laser pointer like you use to torture your cat and an old AOL CD to calculate how much data can be stored on a CD, um, which is a cool experiment that we used to make, or I used to make my students do. Right. So thanks to essentially the physics of light, the precision of the wavelengths of the light, you can turn something that would be macroscopic and moving at this, you know, microscopic and moving at the speed of light. So you wouldn't even be able to detect it in any way or be able to measure it to something that you can measure, which yes. is just, it's just mind bending. But so, so you've explained one example, which is in the LIGO detector, but, but that's like a recent use of the interference of light. Astronomers have been doing this for, for a long time, right? It, it, it's true. And so uh, one of my very first jobs in astronomy was in radio astronomy. I worked at Haystack Observatory in Massachusetts. And I, one of the things that we had to do there was combine the recordings of signal coming in to a variety of different radio telescopes scattered around the world. And what's fabulous about radio telescopes is you can combine the data after the fact. With optical interferometry, we're not that good yet at being able to record individual wavelengths of light. Uh, so when we do optical interferometry, it has to be done physically in the moment. But with radio, you record the signal, you ship all of the data to one location, and then you do what's called finding fringes, which is you work on adjusting the timing of the data on each of the different recordings, the start point. And the reason you have to do this is it turns out that in 1992, when I was doing this prior to GPS, we didn't have the most accurate of clocks. And so we'd be able to line up the data to get all of the wavelengths in sync to allow us to do high resolution radio imaging with very long baseline interferometry by combining the data to make sure that we had that constructive interference pattern. Uh, this idea of interference is, I think, something that's fairly counterintuitive to people, but is one of the most powerful techniques that, that astronomers can use these days. This, that, you know, if you imagine you had like two radio telescopes side by side, and they were both gathering 
radio waves from some point source, but you weren't trying to interfere them, what would you get? And how is that different from it actually being interfered? I, I love the way you phrased that. Um, so, so what you want to do is have the spacing of your detectors such that each of them receives the light and it then gets combined in integer differences of the wavelength of the no, light. But, but I guess I'm just saying, like, what is the difference? Like, why do you want to interfere mm. it and not just have the, the, the gathering capacity of the two separate radio okay. dishes? Sorry, misunderstood it. Yeah. Um, so, so with interferometry, we can essentially, with like the very light, large baseline array in New Mexico that was built to do this all the time, with the various uh, networks that have been set up with telescopes spread out across the planet, we are able to treat all of these individual dishes as a single telescope and get the resolving power that corresponds to the diameter, which could be the diameter of the planet, of the separation between the furthest apart of those telescopes. Right. So, so in other words, if you've got a radio dish on one side of the Earth and you've got a radio dish on the other side of the Earth, and if you can interfere the light that both of them are perceiving of the universe, you don't get you don't get double the 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 resolving power because you've got twice as much telescope. You get a telescope the size of the Earth. Yeah. Sort and, of. And and and. It's, it's one of these things where how faint we're able to observe. So how much light we can gather uh, is directly related to the area of a mirror. So if you double the size of the mirror, you collect four times as much light and are able to see that much fainter of an object. With resolution, it goes strictly as the diameter across the longest side of your telescope. And since we're used to thinking of spherical mirror, not spherical, circular mirrors, we don't normally think of it in terms of uh, being anything other than a circle. But where it gets different is where you have things like the very large telescope down in Chile that are combining the light from uh, four different massive mirrors and a variety of little satellite one meter mirrors. And when all of this gets combined, you can have different resolutions along different axes based on how big the telescope is in these different directions. Right. And that's and I, just weird and awesome. It, right. And I guess the and it's easier to do in radio waves because the wavelength is so long that you can you can be rough. You can you can find, as you said, you can find those edges, you can find those parts and line up the radio waves. And and it also has to do with how we're able to record it. So when the radio waves get detected, you can as it's it's you have a kilometer long long wave you're sensitive to that wave with light the the wavelength itself we can't get the resolution in our recording to sample across that wavelength and and so we have to physically combine the light rather than combine the recordings of the light later right right that it's i mean I, it, no but i mean you can imagine right so imagine you've got something that's like going at the nanometer scale, the wavelength is moving past you with a nanometer, and you've got to align those wavelengths to the individual wavelength. If, say you had a, you know, you had a video from one telescope and a video from the other telescope, and then you tried to line up with precision right to the exact right wavelength, when each one is, as you said, you know, a, a zero followed by eight more zeros, right? Um, th that is really tough. While when your wavelength is centimeters, meters, yes. it gets more feasible. But, but, the, but the ones that do it in real time, the ones down in, in Chile, where the, they're, just, they're just combining the light simultaneously, they can do it because essentially they're just, just turning the knob until they get to the exact right 
fraction of a nanometer you know and and that's pretty much what they're doing uh, i i haven't been down to the vlt in chile but i got to visit the u.s naval observatory a few years ago where they've been doing experimental work on defining best practices and creating optical in this case infrared interferometry that's pretty much where we're still confined is down in the infrared part of uh the no longer radio telescopes but now optical telescopes just optical outside of what we can see with our eyeballs um what they do is they have the light come in and they have all of these different chambers that they adjust the length of so that things are getting reflected fiber optics are getting used to make sure that the path length is the exact right distance to have things combine down to these 100 nanometer scales. So that is, I mean, that is like the the area, and this is all still fairly new in terms of actually being able to do it instrumentally. The the technology at say the very large array down in down in Chile is is amazing and fairly cutting edge. But now there's a whole new class of telescopes that are com coming out things like the the magellan the giant magellan telescope the you know which has i think seven separate big mirrors that will be combined together and there's a there's a bunch more so this this technique because the limit is the size of the telescope yes you know before and, they start to get all mushy because of gravity right so separate <laughs> telescopes and and part of how we're able to uh, focus these multi-mirrored telescopes is actually using interference patterns again, where if you have, for instance, the Hobby Eberly telescope down at McDonald Observatory, you have a mirror that has a, a number of different segments down in the primary. And each of these segments has to be aligned uh, perfectly to be able to get the light into the detector at the top. And if you've ever seen pictures of uh, the Hobby Eberly Telescope or the SALT Observatory down in South Africa for the South African Large Telescope, both the Hobby Eberly and SALT have your typical telescope dome. And then next to it, they have a large tower with a dome on top of it. And it kind of looks like a little robot dude sitting on top of a mountain in both cases. And the reason that they have this configuration is you can open up the dome from the main telescope, open up the little arm with the uh, dome on top of it, and shine lights down onto the mirror and use interference patterns to precisely line up all of these mirrors so that you get the perfect interference pattern of the laser light coming off of all of these mirrors. Wow, that's really cool. So are there any other ways that astronomers use uh, interference? Well, at, at the end of the day, everything that we do involving spectroscopy is just based on the principles of interference, where we have light that is getting scattered and reflected off of gratings. It's getting uh, scattered by going through slits in particular ways. And the way we build a lot of our precise filters that allow us to look at the sun, to only look at narrow colors of light, uh, these are also often built in interference in a way that uses the interference. So for instance, a really good solar filter that takes advantage of interference is one that only allows constructively interfering light to go through uh, a series of films so that light that has the wrong wavelength ends up bouncing out. Light that has the exact right color is able to pass through because of the interference that happens between the films. Yeah, a lot of the times when you see, say, pictures that are taken from spacecraft from NASA and, and Hubble Space Telescope and things like that, they'll say the nanometer wavelength that was used for one of the filters of the image. And so a lot of the times when you see pictures that came from Cassini, for example, back when Cassini used to take pictures and was still alive, um, you would get like, you know, such and such nanometer for 
for one infrared filter and then a different nanometer for a different infrared filter and then a third one and then they would just in computer turn one into red one into blue and one into green and then turn that into what looks like a full color image but the reality is it's just that perfect and as you like they're right down to one nanometer off for each of these colors right each of these these filters that they're using and and the majority of filters that get used in astronomy are more broadband filters where uh, there's a certain percentage of light let in at this color, a slightly different percentage at this color, it's zero at this color. And so you have this curve that defines the amount of throughput as a function of wavelength for the given filter. Uh, any of you who've used the common jo Johnson or Cousins filters to do photometry uh, have encountered these broadband filters. But then there's very specific, these interference filters that can take you down to having a hard cutoff of everything. Well, not everything. It's never everything. Most of the light at colors A through B gets through and then nothing on either side of that. We shall not let you pass. And it's this ability to get these hard edges in what does and doesn't get through that is so awesome about interference filters. What about planet hunting? Well, with, with planet hunting... I mean, I guess you kind of covered everything in spectroscopy, but, you know, with, say, the radio velocity method, they use spectroscopy for that. Yeah, so so there, it's it's not quite the same thing because, uh, yes, it requires you to have a spectroscope, but once you have the spectroscope doing its thing, there's no added interference mm. just because you have a planet. It's simply a matter of where the star is changes from day to day due to having that planet. Right, right. Would it be possible, do you think, to get like interference through gravitational waves? I, so yes, but I don't know if we'll ever be able to measure it. Right. Um, that waves be... interfere, it's what they do. And, and so the question then becomes, what do we have the technology to measure? Right, right. Amazing. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. My pleasure. All right. I keep misplacing my mouse today. Say project 465. Wow. I know I say wow every week, but. We're rocking this stuff. Okay, and I'll upload that later. Uh, Jordan Crouch Couch wants to know, are we looking for alien communication by light or just microwaves? Thanks. How are we looking uh, for alien communication? So in terms of looking for alien communication, we use a whole variety of different radio light with a variety of the different SETI projects. Um, there have been attempts to see if we can identify the kinds of optical signals that might be anticipated, but this has generally been a, a kind of ad hoc retroactive trying to see what we can find. Um, but for the most part, if it's a radio frequency, uh, it has been used at one point in time or another. Yeah, the, the main thing they're listening for is essentially someone sending a targeted radio communication at Earth, but they yeah. have thought about lasers theoretically would be another good way to communicate and so they've been looking for just lasers zapped at earth right and so uh that's optical seti there's optical seti and radio seti and and it's it's not something where you can generally go to a telescope committee and say hi i would like time to look for lasers from little alien humans right. or little alien intelligences just, they just can't get any respect no, they can't. Uh, Christopher Beck wants to know, or said, technically lens coatings for anti-glare are also based on interference, which is cool. Yeah. So same same trick, which is if you can't line up, then get out wavelengths. <laughs> Arjun is asking, after they dial in a clear picture of Sagittarius A star, do they have any other uses for the Event Horizon Telescope? 
we are now we should be getting the first pictures from the event horizon telescope any day now now yeah and and i mean it we never know the full use of data in in until the fullness of time has been passed um phil plate just put out a story yesterday or the day before about how it had just been realized that uh, a planetary system had been detected in data from 1917. Yep. So I, I don't think we can ever say, will there ever be another use for this data, yes or no, uh, because proving a negative is really darn hard. Right, but from what I understand, it's going to be able to resolve the event horizon at Sagittarius A star, but also be usable at the heart of Andromeda and the Triangulum Galaxy, I think. So they're close enough and big enough. To but that data to... hasn't been taken yet, has it? No, no. They've yeah. only they've only tried for the one at the heart of the Milky Way, which is obviously the one that's only 22,000 light years away as opposed to the ones that are, you know, a million plus light years away. Right. But... But having a telescope the size, a radio telescope the size of planet Earth, I'm sure astronomers will be able to think of things that they can do with that. Yes. And have already. I mean, the worldwide telescope, this is already a, a radio. So this is a thing they've been using for quite a while. Yeah. It's just, you know, developing the exact right system and pointing it at the supermassive black hole is a, is a new plan. Yeah. Larry Beckham asked a question that I don't even know if we have the answer for this one. Fermilab's hollow meter has been tried for observing gravitational waves. Could LIGO or Virgo search for quantized space time like the hollow meter? I don't know what any of those words mean other than Fermi. Fermilab, hollow yes, meter. That I don't know. Gravitational waves. We know what those are. I know are. that one. LIGO and Virgo, those are the two gravitational wave experiments. Quantized space time. Yeah, not there. No. Uh, we'll, we can do it. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes sometimes I don't read all the things. John Siffel wants to know off topic, but is there any news about Arecibo? Uh, the astronomers are slowly exiting the country. It's, um, it's what's happening a lot. It's hard to watch. Yeah. It's but a, you can't blame them. It's a, um, it's I'm a, watching... It's a really bad scene there still in, yeah. in Puerto Rico. I, I'm watching Robert uh, uh, Merchant, much and I'm so bad with names. Uh, I've been watching him on Twitter and they don't even have power or water day to day. They'll get water for a few hours here, water for a few hours there. And when you're dealing with that day to day level of just not having basics yeah arjun wants to know uh could you use interferometry with any telescope could we use hubble or jwst since it'll be at l1 um no just because we don't have the they're not built to do that um you have to have systems that are built very very precisely to fly uh in formation hold formation and then relay the data to a central processing unit. Man, can you think of like a telescope that was in the work, some kind of mission, but that was then canceled that would have used the technique of space-based interferometry to perhaps- I think it might've looked at planets yeah, maybe. Terrestrial kinds of planets. Yeah, these rocky things that we yeah. keep trying to find. Yeah, yeah. finding terrestri terrestrial earth finder something like that anyway yeah, yeah so planets, there I don't know there have been plans to develop a space-based interferometer it's just they haven't gotten that far yet yeah and the the capability of doing ground-based interferometry has moved forward so well I mean this is one of those amazing things we just did an, an episode of the guide to space about the super telescopes sort of similar to the episode we did a long time ago about the ground and space based super telescopes and the mm -hmm. amount of uh, sort of the earth based telescopes are proceeding just incredibly quickly. Yes. Like they're going to be finding earth based planets, earth sized worlds, which is just amazing. 
Arjone is asking. <laughs> right. So how did they find the extra chamber in the pyramids? Ar oh, that was so cool. Yes. That was muons. Okay, so there's these subatomic particles called muons that decay extraordinarily rapidly. And they're formed at the top layer of the atmosphere when certain high energy particles hit and they shoot down towards the earth and they have mass. So they're moving slightly less than the speed of light, but because they're moving close to the speed of light, time dilation allows them to exist in our time frame long enough to get to the surface of the planet. Now, uh, the speed at which they're able to, tra to travel uh, is a function of what's between us and them and how many muons we're able to detect is directly related to how much stuff is intervening. And so if I stick a, mu a muon detector out on the curb versus in the basement of my house versus in the attic of my house, they will all have slightly different numbers of muons that they're detecting due to the differing amounts of stuff between them and the creation of the cosmic, uh, between them and the creation of the muons by the cosmic uh, high energy particles. So with, with the pyramids, they were able to basically go, count muons here, count muons here, count muons here, and map out uh, how many muons were detected at different places. And if you have a model of what you think the inside of the pyramid will look like, you should be able to um, predict how many muons should be detected at each given place. And what they found is the number of muons detected with certain cuts through the pyramids indicated that there was a hole that that was changing the counts. So um, it was simply a matter of uh, there wasn't enough intervening stuff eating muons in certain cuts through the pyramid. And it's super cool science. Like we still don't know what's causing fully yeah. those galactic, that galactic cosmic radiation, but we know how to use it as a telescope. We shall exploit it. <laughs> Muons exploit shall it. be yeah. exploited. Same thing with dark matter. We don't know what it is, but we, we don't can... know how to exploit it either. Oh no, we use it for, we use it for uh, uh, gravitational lensing to magnify objects behind it. So you have a galaxy yeah. cluster yeah. that is largely made of dark matter and you can, and you can use it to to magnify the objects that are for, you know, I'll, that are I'll give behind. you that one. Yeah. But it has fewer practical implications than muons. We know how to exploit those practically. All right. I'll show you a bunch of Einstein rings. The most distant galaxies ever seen were used. I, I, I agree, yeah. but it's less practical than knowing there's a hole in the pyramids, which is also not entirely yeah. practical. <laughs> But right, no, it's it's still it's amazing. I I do love these things where we just like we don't know how a particle can get that much speed and that much energy, but but the, at least we can use them to find out there's a hole in the pyramids. I love it. Christopher Beck is asking: Is JWST going to the Earth Moon Lagrange point or the Sun Earth Lagrange point? It's the Earth Moon. Earth Moon L2. No, wait. I believe. No, Let me sun... double check. Am I lying? No, you're lying. Yeah, it's Sun Earth. It's Sun okay. Earth L2. I thought it was supposed to be living in the moon's shadow, though. No. It's... No, that doesn't work. That no, doesn't it's about, work. It's, it's in about... the Earth's. Sh... Okay, yeah. never mind. I'm I'm full of it today. Okay. Any other questions? It's beyond the moon, unless the moon's on the other side of the planet. Right. It's beyond the orbit of the moon, beyond the distance yeah. of the moon. Yeah. It's a million and a half kilometers, which means that we can never fix it. Although I do love this idea that if it does break, then they'll try. Right. So the Orion capsule, in theory, could make it out to the, you know, the L2 Lagrange point and, and they could repair it because it can keep people alive for like 90 days, like four astronauts alive in space for 90 days. So <laughs> Gordon wants to know, uh, does your chair have a three point harness? <laughs> no, it doesn't, but it should. Quadlib, it says, if, uh, speak for yourself. If I ever want to buy a pyramid, I would like to be sure to check if they're not trying to sell me one with a hole in it. 
So th- there you go. That is <laughs> that's that is, a great response. That is, yeah, that is the practice. If you're gonna go and buy a pyramid, you want to make sure that you're getting all of the blocks that you're expecting, and no extra dead bodies. <laughs> or you do want extra dead bodies because it could be I, all kinds of treasure there, right? It it all depends on your perspective. Um, so people are having quite an interesting conversation in the comments just about the places to go online for getting more physics knowledge. So if you oh, want Oh, hyperphysics to... is my favorite. Hyperphysics? Yeah, it's out of, I, it's, I think it's out of either Georgia State or Georgia Tech. Uh, for like basic looking up equations, looking up basic stuff things. Um, yeah, it's at Georgia State. So it's hyperphysics.phy dash A-S-T-R dot G-S-U dot E-D-U. Just Google hyperphysics. Hyperphysics, okay. Um, it's it's rock solid on all the basics. It's basically an online textbook that's better than a real world textbook. That sounds terrific. Uh, speaking of, of galactic cosmic radiation, I'm, I'm reading Endurance, which is the new book by Scott Kelly about his year in space. And uh, you know, although I was, you know, there for the, like I was reporting on it over the course of the year, it's great to hear this stuff from his point of point of view. And he's got these great little details that I'm sort of picking out as as we go. And I want to sort of do some stories and maybe videos about some of these ideas. So one that's really interesting is, is astronauts, when they close their eyes, and this was discovered back in the Apollo era, they see flashes of light, which are these cosmic rays cosmic hitting, rays their retinas. hitting their retinas and they just and and it's this unsettling knowledge all the time that they're being bombarded with radiation that that being even in low earth orbit is about 10 times the radiation of being on, in on the ground and being outside of the magnetosphere is like 10 times beyond that it's also super creepy well that yeah yeah and and so he's he said that you know on the first night it's always really hard to get to get back used to that when you get back up to space for the for the you know this is this was his third flight to the space station and yeah and even that still is a little unsettling to see yeah. the flashes of light in your eyes as as particles are radiating you <laughs> yes all right, well, I think we've reached the end of our half hour. I know uh, we've got to all roll, so we better move on. Uh, just a reminder, beep boop. Uh, was that you? Was that me? Yeah, that was me. Okay. I'm being reminded I have an appointment in 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, just want to remind everybody, a big thanks to the WSH crew. This is, of course, the yes. community that is really acts like the producers of this show. Uh, it was funny, actually. I'm now going to go into a little t- – uh, I was ex- talking at uh, Patreon, talking about sort of the relationship that – that we have as creators with the community that sort of works with us. And I was mm-hmm. explaining that that with the folks in the WSH crew, they're the executive producers of the of the show. Like mm-hmm. literally, they are the executive yes. producers of the show. And so if they want to get a business card printed, if they think that that's going to get a better chance of getting, Go say, Stephen it. Hawking on the show, by all means, make some business cards that says you're the executive producer of the Weekly Space Hangout yeah. and uh, and hand that out. And uh, and they were just like, what? I'm like, yeah. Like, I don't even know like, sometimes the guests that are going to be on the show. And it was just this this original experiment that we had with, with Nancy Graziano where and Nancy, was, Nancy was like, I, I want to get this guest on the show. And I'm like, ask Do them. it. Just tell them, yeah. ask them, and I'll I'll do my part, which is interview them, and it's just been amazing. And in the last, I mean, you just think about some of the guests that we've had, uh, the just, I mean, the the head of the astronaut health and safety, the head of the of NASA's science directorate, astronomers from ESA and. Uh, folks from just so many great agencies. It's just amazing. And it's so much fun to work with the folks from the WSH crew. So if you want to take your your sort of fandom of the show to the next level, go to wshcrew.space, join the Slack channel, and that's where we hang out, and that's where all of the people down here you see are hanging out, and it's a party. So you should uh, go and and participate. 
<laughs> there you go. Nancy's saying, yeah, we've got a template. You got a template. So then when you meet Elon <laughs> Musk, right, you say, hey, Elon, you want to come on the the Weekly Space Hangout? And he'd be like, who are you? And you're like, I'm the executive producer. And then that he'll take that seriously. How could he not? All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you all. I have no idea when next. Hopefully next Friday. Next Friday. We'll see you then. Bye.